<laughs> Thanks for the invitation. I would have liked, I would have preferred to be there in 3D, but unfortunately, it has to be only virtually. And um, what, what uh, I'm going to talk about, what I wanted to discuss with you today is um, white dwarfs. Um, white dwarfs that unfortunately are a bit tainted by by this uh, statement apparently made by Eco Eben in during the 80s that any fool can make a white dwarf. In the sense, it seems like uh, it's uh, it's so trivial to 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 make white dwarf model and to study white dwarfs. But probably what he was just referring to the fact that their structure is much simpler on paper than other evolutionary phases. But uh, there has been, uh, you might have noticed, uh, lots of uh, publication recently about white dwarfs, especially coming from Gaia, uh, DR2 uh, release. So I think it's a, it's a good time to discuss a bit what we have learned in the last years about white dwarfs, what we don't know yet, and what we can do with the next, uh, with the next uh, major facilities that we will come online in the, in the, in the, in the next years. I mean, uh, we all know, I mean, that white dwarfs, most over 90% of all stars in the universe will end up their life as white dwarfs. And uh, when we look at white dwarfs in our galaxy, for example, I mean, that in white dwarfs, there's a lot of information about the past history uh, of our galaxy and of our, our star clusters, uh, because they're just, uh, let's say, the remnant. Uh, of the of the evolution of stars, and uh, they are also very interesting in terms of basic physics because their high density and low temperatures temperatures make them ideal labs for lots of uh, phenomena that happen at uh, in the matter at very extreme conditions, as we will see in a moment. So just I'm going to talk briefly, of course, because the subject is is is, is huge about this summary of white dwarf basic physics and the white dwarf cosmochronology. Then I'm, I'm I'm going to summarize a bit some main results that we learned from uh, HST observations from Gaia uh, data, and very interestingly, what we learn uh, from uh, non radial pulsations of white dwarfs, both in terms of uh, basic physics and also in terms of the internal structure of uh, white dwarfs. And then uh, uh, some outlook, some discussion about uh, uh, ELT and JWST and what they, what we can learn about white dwarfs using those telescopes. So, I mean, just just remind you very briefly, I mean, white dwarfs are the end stage of the evolution of low intermediate mass stars. And um, the structure is in principle simple. I mean, most of the white dwarfs, almost all of them, bar a reasonably small number coming from the evolution of stars between, let's say, six and eight, nine solar masses. Most of our dwarf are made of a carbon oxygen core. And then we have a, an envelope of uh, helium and hydrogen, or just helium, in a fraction of our dwarfs. I mean that the thickness in mass of the envelope is very, is very narrow. Typically, hydrogen envelopes are 10 to the minus four times the mass of the white dwarf at most and the thickness of the helium layers is about 1% uh, of the mass of the white dwarf, typically all the rest is in the carbon oxygen core. As I say, if the progenitors are between, let's say, 6, 7, and let's say 8, 9, the, 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 the boundaries are not that uh, well defined, depends also on the metallicity and other physics inputs. In that case, the, the cores are made of oxygen and neon because they form after the end of carbon burning. Where is uh, of central carbon burning those cores? So usually, the white dwarfs are characterized by an initial final mass relation in the sense that their mass, the mass of the white dwarf, is much smaller than the mass of the progenitor of the main sequence, as we know. And I mean, this is just qualitatively what you expect in terms of initial final mass relationship for white dwarfs. Typically, the most massive white dwarfs, at least the most massive carbon oxygen white dwarf should be around one sort of mass. And the oxygen neon one, probably a bit more massive, over 1.1 up to 1.2. And the important thing, why they're used for cosmochronology is because there is a very well-defined relationship between the cooling age of the white dwarf, the time 
elapsed since they start started cooling, since they formed essentially, and their luminosity. That you see in, the, in this uh, in this plot, this relationship depends on the mass of the white dwarf, but there is a one-to-one -one relationship between luminosity and cooling time. That's why we can use them for uh, cosmochronology because of the existence of this relationship here. And uh, as 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 we all process, there are no no nuclear reactions going on, apart mainly maybe for the brightest stages of the cooling and with thick hydrogen envelope, then we might have some, some, hydrogen, some residual hydrogen burning there. But typically, the, 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 the energy released by the white dwarfs is the, basically the internal energy of the ions, while the pressure is, is provided by the, elect, by the, the generate electrons. So the white, the evolution of white dwarf is a cooling process. The white dwarf starts bright and hot, and slowly they cool down and they get fainter. And uh, lots of interesting things happen during this cooling in terms of physics. And this, this is essentially this uh, formula gives you the relationship between the luminosity and the energy sources of the white dwarf. This, uh, this is the photoluminosity. This is the neutrino luminosities. When the white dwarfs are very hot and bright, down to luminosities of the order of log L over so luminosity minus 1, minus 1.5, there's a lot of neutrino emission. And at um, and the, and the same time, together with the neutrino emission, there is, this is the contribution of the internal energy of the ions that provides some of the luminosity. This is the contribution from the contraction of the star the compression of the star. And we know that white dwarfs, although zero order approximation of evolution is, consta at consta is a constant radius, actually they contract a bit. It's not really a constant radius. There is a, is a slow contraction during the evolution of the white dwarf. Not much, but there is some contractions, essentially because the electrons are not, at the degenerate electrons are not at zero temperature. So they can still lose some energy, uh, a bit of their energy. Then, when in this luminosity range here, we have a phase the first phase transition of the ions, the ions from a gas, uh, from the state of gas, they move, they, they, they have a transition to a liquid state, to a liquid state. Um, this transition happens for when this Coulomb parameter gamma is about one. Coulomb parameter is essentially the ratio between the potential energy of the electrostatic interaction over the kinetic energy of the ions. So there is this phase of uh, in which the cooling, when the cooling ions are in the liquid phase, and still the main contribution to the energy budget is here, is their internal energy here. Then when gamma is around 180, this magic number, then we have crystallization. So the ions, they have this phase transition from liquid to solid. So we have latent heat release in this phase transition due to the difference of in entropy between the liquid and the solid state. And typically, for every ion that crystallizes, you have a KT of energy released. And another thing that happened during, uh, during uh, crystallization, this phenomenon of, of chemical separation that I will mention briefly in a moment, which contributes to the energy budget through this term here. This is the term, is the variation of the internal energy due to the variation of the chemical composition within the structure. This is a term that exists for all stars, even main sequence stars. It just, because every time you transform, you change chemical composition within the star, you have a contribution to the luminosity due to this term. But of course, when you're nuclear burning, this contribution is completely negligible compared to the nuclear energy release. And then when the, the luminosity gets very faint and the temperature is very cold, then uh, we have this phase called the bicooling. The cooling gets very, very fast because in the internal energy equation, the specific heat drops very fast as the third power of the temperature. And so this is the so-called the bicooling phase, which is probably never 
the, 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 the existing white dwarf that never reached this phase yet. Within the age of the universe, this phase has not been reached yet by, by white dwarfs. When I mention phase separation, I'm not going into any detail, but phase separation means that essentially we all well, we have seen phase diagrams when we were studying molecular physics. And essentially a phase diagram is like is like something like that. This is a phase diagram of a carbon-oxygen mixture. This is the mass fraction of carbon. This is the temperature uh, parameterized as a function of the crystallization temperature of carbon. Essentially, what, what this means is this one. Imagine that our core, uh, our white dwarf core has 50-50 composition of carbon and oxygen. So it's cooling down. So the temperature goes down. This is the 0.5% abundance of carbon in the core. The temperature goes down. Eventually, when this, when we reach the upper uh, line of the phase diagram, this is when we start the crystallization. But at crystallization, a 50-50 chemical composition cannot be in equilibrium. So the equilibrium happens only if the carbon abundance is 30%. So we have a sort of redistribution of the balances during crystallization due to the phase diagram. So without going into many details, the bottom line is the following. For example, look at here, this plot. If this was the abundance of carbon in the white dwarf, in the core of a white dwarf 0.6 or masses, 50% carbon, that means the oxygen is the other 50%. After crystallization, the abundance of carbon the profile of carbon within the star is no longer flat, but this is the profile. And oxygen is just one minus this, just it's the complementary to one. You see, there is a redistribution. If the initial abundance of carbon was this one, the dashed line is the, the abundance after the uh, crystallization and the same in these other two uh, examples here. And, it, and this different distribution produces different energy releases due to the due to the phase, uh, due to the redistribution, due to the phase diagram, and you have four different types of cooling types. So this chemical stratification of carbon oxygen is very, very important because upon crystallization, due to this phase separation, the details of the chemical stratification can give you different, very different cooling times, okay? The largest cooling times are when you have a 50-50 flat profile, which is not realistic, but it gives you an idea of what to expect. And the other phenomenon, and as we have this, essentially this has been hypothesized in the, in the early 90s and then again in the early 2000s, and really uh, we have verified it really exists with HST data, as I will mention later, is also is neon diffusion. During the liquid phase of the carbon oxygen core, the neon, because there's still also a bit of neon in the carbon oxygen core, typically the, the fraction of neon is equal to the in original metallicity of the star. So we were, we were talking about solar metallicity progenitor of a white dwarf that would be about 2% of neon in the core, which is very small, a uh, small amount. But neon in the liquid phase tend to sink towards the center, and the sinking stops at the, at the crystallization front within the core. And this, this sinking of neon changes the chemical composition and again contributes to the energy of the white dwarf to this term here, again, like the phase separation. So all these phenomena, both phase separation and neon diffusion, the liquid phase, they add energy to the white dwarf and they slow down the cooling compared to models where we don't include these contributions. And there's been a lot of debate going on for several years about whether to include phase separation and still some models don't really include it yet. So after this preamble, I hope not too boring, then, I mean, what are the tools of uh, white dwarf cosmochronology? Well, like uh, the standard things that we do with isochron or main sequence, the and stars, we build isochrons. Uh, we build, uh, that means HR diagram and core minute diagram of white dwarfs all in a population with uh, single edges, single initial chemical composition. And if the dashed lines are cooling tracks in the HR, HR diagram, solid lines, the thick solid lines, are the corresponding isochrons for different edges. 
the isogram is this uh, uh, characteristic shape the bright face that correspond to a constant to a constant mass cooling track then you have a sort of turn to the blue let's call it turn off to the blue this is the, these are the this represent this turn off represent the contribution of more massive white dwarf smaller radii that cool down longer at the fixed total age because they progenitor or lived shorter lifetime so this is the typical shape that we find again in the white dwarf in the cmds in the optica solid a dotted line are isogrons solid with the hydrogen envelopes and dotted line for white dwarf with helium envelopes they are very similar but at all the ages the the end the bottom end of the hydrogen envelope white dwarf is much brighter than the bottom end of the helium envelope white dwarf because eventually at all the ages helium envelope white dwarf will cool down much much faster because the opacity in the helium envelope is much lower than the hydrogen envelope and the opacity in a way regulates like a valve the release of energy from the surface so lower opacity means faster cooling times so at all the ages it's very high. We have never seen the end of the helium envelope white dwarf sequence at all the edges. You see only the hydrogen envelope uh, white dwarf sequences, the, their termination. All right. So, with all this, this background, I mean, we, let's say white dwarf cosmogronology started in 1987, essentially with uh, when uh, it was produced sort of the first um let's say complete luminosity function of white dwarfs in the solar neighborhood in this wing at the time 1987 the title of the paper was a new method to determine the edge of the universe that's how it was called the, the paper essentially the points are the luminosity function of white dwarfs in the solar neighborhood and you can see a drop and the solid line is a theoretical one and uh, matching the drop the observed drop with the, the drop in the theoretical luminosity function gives you an estimate of, of the age of, of the disk of the galaxy when the disk started to form look this is a this here there is the assumption of continuous star formation is a star formation rate from the beginning of the formation of the disk up to now if you change the detail if it's not continuous but uh, not flat the star formation rate but there are let's say uh burst uh, different edges actually the, the magnitude of this drop doesn't really change much and this drop means that the number of, of, of white dwarf uh drops fast it doesn't go to zero because there is a tail here of the most massive white dwarf that tend to be fainter uh, than the less massive one but this is the drop of the most populous uh this is the drop of the number of the most populous mass of white dwarf in in, in the solar neighborhood typically 0.6 solar masses and if you change the age of, of the of the of the disk this drop up in here here as uh, younger edges here at older edges anyway this is what was proposed in 1987 this was this is very much cited. They found at the time an age of no, 9.3 gigahertz plus minus about one gigahertz. And uh, and that was it. That's been that was it for white dwarf cosmochronology for a long time until HST came into play. And now with HST, we could find uh, uh, white dwarf or in global clusters. I mean, we, we could see white dwarf in open clusters, but even before uh, HST, we will see uh, all the bright ones in a uh, nearby young open cluster. We couldn't, you, you can't see many white dwarfs there. There are, there are not those many bright white dwarfs because there's not many stars in this in open cluster. Moreover, bright white dwarfs, they evolve very fast. So we couldn't do much with that. But now with global clusters, we can do much more much more populated clusters and we can see for four of four of them three or four of them the termination the white dwarf sequence it's like we can see here so there's been a number of papers uh on this comparing the age from the bottom end of the, um, some of them also with my colleagues in padova bedin and, and and colleagues 
And uh, you can compare the edge that you get from the bottom end of the Waldorf sequence with the edge you get from the turnoff. In, uh, in, in usually you find uh, good agreement between the two edges, which is uh, good, which is very interesting because there are two completely different uh, physical structures of main sequence stars and white dwarf stars. But we, there are also surprises that, that, that those are the interesting one. The surprises like what we found uh, in a series of paper published starting in 2005 up to 2008 in this old open cluster NGC 6791, eight giga years old from the main sequence turn off, we found a very odd white dwarf cooling sequence, this one, the dots here. If you overlay, overlay isochrons, whether the turn off, this is the eight giga years isochron that matches the turn off, this is the eight giga year isochron for the white dwarf, and there are two sort of like two termination the white dwarf sequence here that corresponded to six and four giga years. They will lie here on the turn off. So clearly, there's something very odd here. If you count, instead of a CMD, you take the luminosity functions, these two terminations correspond to these two peaks, these, these, these dots with arrow bars. And these isochrons here, if you do the luminosity function from this isochron, you will have this dotted, this dotted one, the dotted points, are uh, the luminosity function for edges of eight, and six giga years old. So clearly here we are we were completely off. We didn't know what was going on. And this is here that it turned out that if you include uh, a neon diffusion, you have longer cooling times because you have extra energy. And if you include neon diffusion in, in the white dwarf model, as has been done here in Garcia Barrow et al. in these two papers, then what happens is that this fainter peak you can match it with an eight giga year old isochron in agreement with the turn off edge. There is still the bright peak whose origin is a bit mysterious. We think, as we propose, that these are uh, uh, unresolved white dwarf, white dwarf binaries. Because interesting enough, the difference in luminosity between these two peaks is 0.75 magnitudes. Other, idea, other lines of thought said that, oh, well, this is the termination of the helium of massive helium core white dwarfs, about 0.5 solar masses, coming from um, sort of, uh, I mean, from stars that missed the helium flash because this cluster has some extreme horizontal branches, are blue horizontal branch stars, despite its twice, uh, twice uh, solar metallicity. I mean, I don't know what is exactly the solution. I still think there might be the better bet is what dwarf, what dwarf uh, resolved binaries, but this is still an open problem. But the faintest, the faint end of, of the cooling sequence can be matched by uh, what dwarf has with the same edges that are not if we include neon 22 diffusion in the liquid phase. Another interesting result was Omega Centauri because. If you look at the at the white dwarf, here we could see only it, it, um, the bright part of the cooling sequence in this paper in 2013. And uh, but if you look at the UV, you see a split is a bimodal sequence then blends together. You won't you won't see this split in the optical. And the interesting point is that the split is matched by two two different white dwarf masses. This one, this sequence here, will be the standard one with an 0.55 solar mass white dwarf, what you expect, these luminosities. The other one, you need in a, something around 0.46 solar mass white dwarf. Now, when you are 0.46 solar mass white dwarf, you can try either carbon oxygen core or helium core. The location is the same. And uh, if you, if, the, the, the idea to explain this is that this low mass white dwarf, bright low mass uh, bright white dwarf sequence comes from the from uh, white dwarfs produced by the helium rich population in this cluster that has failed to uh, to reach helium ignition at uh, the tip of the Regia branch because 
This helium-rich population produces blue extreme horizontal bright stars. And so the idea is some of these uh, fraction of this population didn't reach the core mass high enough to ignite helium. They just missed helium ignition. So it's a sort of the continuation of the blue horizontal bright stars. If you go, if you go down in mass, instead of making a blue horizontal branch or extreme horizontal branch uh, star, you will make a massive helium core, white dwarfs. And that, that's what we think it happened. And this would square with what Calamid et al found in 2008, um, uh, that they expected a large fraction of helium core white dwarfs uh, in, in a cluster from their analysis. So this is very interesting. We didn't find this. It's not this split wasn't found uh, previously, and uh, that's a very interesting result. And uh, there is a link, essentially, with the multiple population uh, uh, phenomenon in, in global class. And then another result from HST is uh, the discovery, the first detection of white dwarfs in the bulge. A few years ago, Calamid et al. That was interesting. That had never been observed. What dwarfs in the bulge? They are they are here. They are TV here. Where they are in the in, in the diagram, and lots of them seems to be all low mass. Even if you take away Novi uh, um, CVs, but there are what seems to be normal white dwarfs that are very low mass. And yeah, the, this is this is the the solid line is a is a white dwarf track of 0.23 solar masses, and this is the standard of 54 solar masses. This is a simulation if you include, starting from the 0.54, if you include the photomedic errors that are big, you expect to see these clouds of point, but here you still have stars red than these cloud of points that you expect from the photomedic errors. So probably there is a, a large fraction of a very low mass helium core white dwarfs here in this field of the bulge. Then Gaia, especially data release two in, in 2018, has also uh, raised a number of interesting issues about white dwarfs because now we have a huge sample of white dwarfs with accurate parallaxis in the solar neighborhood, for example. And there's been a number of papers here. There's, there is, there's been a sort of question controversy of what we are seeing here. This is a, this is a CMD, the Gaia CMD of white dwarfs within, uh, I think this is about 200 parsec or 150 parsec from the sun. These are the points, the points are the data. And this paper by Kili, Kilich et al. 2018, if you overlay uh, the uh, cooling tracks 0.6 or mass stars, which is a typical mass of white dwarf in this magnitude range. The red line is the hydrogen atmosphere models. The purple line is the helium atmosphere model. And you see this uh, bifurcation here is not matched. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. What kind, of, what, what do you expect in terms of uh, envelopes of white dwarf here? Well, these, these here, the, the sequence that overlaps with the, that is consistent with the hydrogen atmosphere uh, cooling tracks are the orange one here. For some of them, we have a spectroscopy. So these are, these are hydrogen envelope, the DA, hydrogen envelope. So the red, the red model matches the orange one, as you expect. These are hydrogen envelope, white dwarfs, spectroscopically, and that's the model that matches them. The problem is this other branch. This other branch, there is a mixture. There is a mixture. There are some DA, hydrogen. Then there are some DB, helium envelope, pure helium envelope, like the models. And then there are some of these other types, DQ, DC, DZ. DQ, DZ are essentially helium envelope with some contamination from carbon or from other metals. Now, there are no white dwarf models for this chemical composition. But the idea is that the helium one, the helium, uh, uh, the helium models with the helium uh, envelopes should be reasonably equivalent to these ones, at least at this magnitude, but it's by no means, by no means sure, okay? But anyway, despite this, the conclusion of these others was that these ones, 
are su very massive, are super massive uh, white dwarf, because of course, if you want to overlie the purple line here, you need to increase the mass by a lot. Higher masses move are at lower radii, that means they move towards higher effective temperature, higher, bluer color, a fixed magnitude. So this was the conclusion that there was an excess of massive white dwarf, maybe coming from merging. Um, the interesting point is that uh, the year after Bergeron, Pierre Bergeron et al, they computed new model atmospheres uh, for helium envelopes of white dwarfs, and they found that essentially this, this is not, it's not a big uh, problem here. This is, these are the two sequences, sorry, I'll come back. These two sequences here, here they are split. This is the upper sequence, and these are the other DAs that we know from spectroscopy. So essentially, these are the DA stars. You see the bulk of DA stars have a mass of about 0.6 giga, uh, sorry, 0.6 solar masses, as you expect, as the red line, as the red track in the in the previous in the plot from Kilich et al. And these are this is the other sequence, the bifurcation. This is the, the fainter sequence that couldn't be matched by 0.6 solar mass models by Kilich et al. But here, with this new model, with this new helium envelopes, helium atmosphere from Bergeron et al. Actually here, you know, these are tracks 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, sorry, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8, 1, 1 0.2. 0 0.4, 0 0.6, 0 0.8. Here again, you match between 0 0.6 and 0 0.8, so the mass is a bit like the DA white dwarfs. So the bond is not such a big, this need to invoke the presence of lots of supermassive white dwarfs to explain uh, the morphology of the white dwarf CMD in the solar neighborhood. So it's not clear whether there is, uh, let's, let's call it a problem or not. It seems like there isn't. Another interesting point is that the same paper, Bergeron et al. derived the mass radius relationship for uh, uh, for these uh, for these white dwarfs here in the in the solar neighborhood. Sorry. Oh, sorry. I did something wrong. Uh, uh, I pressed something wrong. I don't we know. We see the slide. Oh, you see the slide? We still see, we still see the slide with the or maybe not. Oh, OK. The, so you see the, the slide? With the, with the, yeah. OK, thank At you. Least I, I'm seeing the slide. Uh, okay. Sorry. It disappeared from my end now. OK, sorry. OK. <laughs> sorry. Now it's back. It's back also for you. Yeah, no, no, yeah, yeah, now it's fine. Sorry, I, I must have pressed okay. something wrong. Sorry. Okay. Perfect, perfect. Okay, thank you. And so the, this is the mass radio relationship, which is very interesting because despite the fact that we believe there is a mass radio relationship, there must be. I mean, if the, the, the empirical confirmation is very is very weak, and this is probably this is the one the best that we have uh, still. I mean, these are mass radii of these white dwarfs, uh, these are carbon-oxygen cores, the dashed lines, at three different effective temperatures, okay? And um, this is uh, the hottest and this is the coolest, effective temperature, hottest and coolest. And this is a iron core white dwarf, just uh, in comparison. You see the, the the black dots are let's say let's call it the, the data with the best data. The red one are less less good data. So the black circle they tend to follow reasonably well the sequence. There is a spread, but this is the error bar. The red, the less the less good data are distributed in a very different way around the line. So, but that that's the best test of the mass radius relationship for white dwarf that we have at the moment. Still from Gaia DR2. And another very interesting result from Gaia is uh, this one by Tremblay et al. last year, where essentially this is again the usual diagram that you've seen before. These are three cooling tracks. These are uh, hydrogen envelope models. This is the dashed lines. They mark the range or magnitudes where theory tells you that crystallization and phase separation is happening. Okay. So what they did, they they calculated the determined luminosity function from this diagram for this mass range, open one, one point one, open sorry, open nine, one point 
1.1. There is a reason why they did that, I will say in a moment. And the, the dot, the, the red points are uh, the luminosity function. The solid lines, the absurd one, sorry, the solid lines are the theoretical ones. If you don't include, uh, you don't put lead and heat, you don't put separation, uh, and one is if you put lead and heat but no separation, the solid one, if you put lead and heat plus separation, tells you that to match it, you have to include lead and heat, the first separation to match it best, as best as possible. They didn't include low lower masses because the lower masses, the, the, the um, crystallization overlaps with another phenomenon that I didn't talk about, which is called convective coupling. It's another process, that's not going to detail, that also tends to increase the cooling time of the wet dwarf. So they just wanted to isolate wet dwarf where we, we have only crystallization that delays the cooling at this stage. That's why they selected, oops, sorry, that's why they selected this mass range. And they show that you need to include lead and heat and phase separation to improve the match with observations. Still, I still have another, another ongoing question, um, still from the same CMD, it's always the same. The, the, the local white dwarfs is, is this one. Is this one, the con well, the controversy, the debate is about these ones, this sort of uh, um, enhancement of number of white dwarfs in this region of the CMB, of the CMD. So these are the white dwarfs, they're here, they have masses between 1.1 and 1.2 solar masses. It's been called Q branch. Q because here some of the white dwarf are DQ, that means they are what helium atmosphere white dwarf with some carbon. But despite that, the point is the interest the, the question was that models predict that these white dwarf here are uh, have an age, a cooling uh, have an age of about one giga year, have a cooling age of about one giga year. Okay, as you can see. But from the transverse velocity, if, if you accept the relationship between transverse velocity and age, 10% of this should have an age, at least adding the progenitor age, they should have an age of at least six, seven giga years. Now, if these are massive white dwarfs, so the progenitor age is very, uh, is very short, so it's negligible compared to their cooling time. So this was the question, what's going on here? So there is some extra, some extra delay, uh, some extra delay is needed to explain this uh, branch. In this paper, Chen et al. then really calculate what dwarf models. So they hypothesize, hypothesize some additional delay. Remember, these are what dwarf that are, this is a constant star formation A. So what dwarf are fed the constant rate onto the sequence. So this is essential how we have to visualize these, uh, the CMD, and here are the stars. You have to add some extra delay to this red point to keep the Q branch at this, in the observed part of the CMD. And what has been observed, sorry, and one solution is that probably is neon diffusion. Is neon diffusion, but to, have, to delay the cooling time by so much, you need the carbon oxygen core, not neon, uh, oxygen neon cores, because in oxygen neon core, the neon diffusion doesn't do much. So you need very massive carbon oxygen white dwarf, that means you need merging. It, you don't make usually carbon oxygen white dwarf from single star evolution, carbon oxygen white dwarf with mass above one solar mass. And so what they did, they simulated the luminosity function in this part of the CMD with uh, different percentages of merging amongst the white dwarf more massive than one solar mass. And they found that 50% if 50 of the white dwarf more massive than one solar mass are carbon oxygen coming from merging or lower mass white dwarfs, then you can reproduce the number of stars here in the cube branch. You're gonna produce the number of stars here. That means essentially you, 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 can, you, you can match you, you obtain edges here of the order of a few giga years. So you, you, the, the evolution slows down so much that you can reproduce the distribution, these, uh, these uh, higher density of stars here in the cube branch. So it seems like this, 
this, uh, this can be explained simply by neon diffusion, but merging of carbon oxygen white dwarf to make a substantial fraction of this massive white dwarf here in this part of the diagram. And then, and, then, and, then other, and then we have also result from the initial final mass relationship, still thanks to Gaia. And just a couple examples that Barbara made with the uh, uh, role in Bedin in Padua, where we got, for example, CMDs of the IADs, and we can determine the initial final mass relationship from the age from the turn off and the position of, uh, of the stars, these IADs and precipi along the, the cooling track. From the cooling age, knowing the, the age of the cluster, we, de we determine the age of the progenitor, hence we can get the initial mass. And we found this for the players IADs, and these solid lines are theoretical initial final mass relationships from AGB calculations. And this is again is higher, the one predicted by theory. This is from one group, another in another group, still we have the same discrepancy. Higher what what dwarf mass is compared to what predicted by theory. Interesting results still about the initial final mass relationship is Marie Gotal 2020, where they found in this mass initial mass range between 1.5 and 2, 2.3, that is non-monotonic. It seems like there is an, an increase and then a decrease and then an increase again, which is against what we what we always found, always known or expected. And again, they could link this. To, uh, to the properties of the deficiency of the third red gap in the, in the IGB model. So there is a very interesting link between this feature here and the physics of IGB models. So I think actually I'm going, I'm going a bit too long, a bit too, too slow. I just mentioned two things of the white dwarf part session because they are very interesting. I won't mention anything about uh, a fundamental physics because there's no time. I just wanted to mention that from what dwarf pulsation, from uh, from um, non radial pulsation, we can study as we know the interior uh, of stars, and and a very interesting result, very controversial, was published in the last two years by Jean Miguel et al. and then redone and refined by Sharpinet et al. Essentially, this is a DB white dwarf. With this uh, interesting name, uh, the, the analysis of the non radial pulsation and the photometry has provided a gravity effective temperature for for this object. And if in the, we know the mass also, so if and, and we can derive, well, no, we, we have been able to derive the internal profile of carbon and oxygen and helium within this white dwarf. Now. In red is the older result, 2018 result. In black is the 2019 result that are reasonably similar, but just to show you, dotted lines is oxygen, solid lines is carbon, and dashed lines is helium. Okay, seems what's going on here. The point is, what the theoretical models cannot explain is the total amount of oxygen found in this determined through the analysis of the pulsations. There was an interesting paper by the Geronimo et al. 2019, where there's, it seems like there's no way that this profile can be reproduced by the by theoretical model. And now there is a debate. Is there an issue with the asteroseismic analysis? Or there are really something that we have not understood at all in the theoretical model? I mean, here, to explain this, we are talking about helium burning in the progenitor model and the evolution of the stratification during the helium burning and during the asymptotic jam branch phase, the early AGB and the thermal parts phase. And there's no way that this can be reproduced by the radical model. I mean, this is an interesting result. If there is something that we don't know, that's that's very interesting. At the moment, there's no, it's, it's very recent, so that there's no solution to this dilemma here. I'm not going to talk about axioms because there's no time. I just wanted to mention briefly, AWST and ELT will open a sort of new window on on, uh, Aster on uh, white dwarf cosmochronology. I mean, we talked about this in a paper with uh, 
in bonus allies at guild mods in 2012, where we anticipated what we see in the infrared, here we show in kg minus k, how do white dwarf isochrons look in the infrared, thinking of JWST ALT. And that's how they look like, which is very different from what you see in the optical. You see, the shape is different. These are different edges. Sorry, these are different edges, sorry. This is fixed edge, these are the cooling track, you see the behavior, the shape of the cooling track also is different because of the bolometric corrections. The, the cooling track of individual masses, they turn to the blue here. This is due to the, to the um, collision in, to induced absorption of, uh, oops, of H2 molecule. And when you combine the cooling time, the progenitor lifetime, uh, of of your uh, of the of the uh, of the individual white dwarfs, when you convert them and you calculate isograms for a given edge, that's the shape that you get. Very different shape compared to the optica. And the interesting point here is the at all the edges, the separation between the isogram is twice the separation that you get in the optica. So there is more resolving power uh, for, for at all the edges here. If you take the luminosity function, the separation between 10, 12, and 12, 14 giga years in K is twice the separation in I in the I band or in the B band. So it's more, they are more sensitive to edge. It would be interesting to look at the global cluster in this field. That means with JWST and with ELT, we will have a more accurate edge and a more accurate comparison with the Tarnoff. And probably we might learn even more about the physics going on in, in, in the white dwarfs, looking at the infrared. And yeah, it just then, after we published the paper, then I got the filter profile for JWST, and exactly, if you do this, they are equivalent to J and K, you have exactly the same shape. But another interesting point, that we, something interesting is that the separation between hydrogen atmosphere, helium atmosphere isochrons is much wider in the infrared filter than in the optica. Because one point is that we don't know what is the fraction of uh, e hydrogen helium atmosphere in star clusters. It's typically four in the field, but again, that changes with the effective temperature because of mixing between the hydrogen layers and the helium layers, depending on the thickness of the hydrogen layer. They're all a huge discussion there. Can't enter into details, but in global, in, in usually the assumption that in star class, in global class, there are only the A, because some spectroscopy of the brightest one gives us only uh, the A, hydrogen atmosphere. But this, this larger separation, if we have accurate enough photometry, will really allows us to disentangle the two sequences and really see whether we have helium atmospheres, white dwarfs or not. This is very interesting because the presence of helium atmosphere or hydrogen atmosphere is tied to what happened during the AGB phase, tied to when exactly there was the last thermal pulse, essentially. How much, uh, how much hydrogen was left on top of the carbon oxygen core uh, when, when, the, when the star leaves the AGB, whether there's been a late thermal pulse or not. So this is quite interesting also from the point of, of stellar physics. And so, to wrap, up, wrap it up, because I think I've gone on uh, long enough, we have, uh, we have a few things. I, I, would have, I would have mentioned, sorry, because I don't think I have time, and things about uh, uh, fundamental physics and uh, bound on the mass of the axions using white dwarf, but we will have, we are having already, we will have with tests, for example, more uh, data about percent white dwarfs that we can use not only to study the issue of the presence and eventually mass limit for uh, axions, but also to do more studies about inferring the inter internal chemical composition white dwarf, which is a very important problem because as I, as I hope I show you clearly before at the beginning, the stratification, the internal stratification of the white dwarf has a huge effect on the cooling times on white dwarf. It's very important, especially through phase separation. Okay, then we will have uh, um, in, with Gaia, there will be another release, I believe next year. We will have even more improved white dwarf luminosity function in the solar neighborhood. 
and we might have studying, for example, again, or in more open classes, we might have even more news about the what dwarf initial, mana, initial final mass relationship that it starts to get even more interesting. It's not only uncertain, but now if you have this sort of non-monotonicity non around two solar masses, this is a new feature, completely unexpected. So adds more interest to this, to this subject. And then JWST and probably also ELT, we can look, we can we can detect the termination of a dwarf sequence in a larger sample of global classes. There are at least 11 global classes where we should be able to do that. At the moment, it's only three or four. I never remember. There will be 11. And uh, we can have an improve, improve white dwarf edges from the cooling sequence, but not only improve white dwarf edges because of the, uh, higher sensitivity at all the edges of uh, the white dwarf eyes are going to age, but also we can have a better char characterization of the cooling sequences of global cluster. We can study, finally, the presence of uh, helium atmosphere white dwarfs, not only in the bright part, but also along almost all the, the white dwarf cooling sequences. They will be very interesting whether we, we detect them, there aren't at all. There are, it's quite interesting because this is telling us something about the AGB, the AGB uh, model physics and low metal lizardies. Okay, this is, I just think this is, this is again, is a very interesting uh, question. And uh, I think I'll leave it here. Thank you very much.